Welcome to the fifth part of our Andalusian adventures. In the previous part, we explored the El Torcalda Antequera Nature Reserve and ventured through the captivating cave town of Setenil de las Bodegas. In this video, we will delve into an intriguing Martian-like landscape to discover the history of the riot into mines. If you missed the previous four parts, be sure to check them out. This morning, we journeyed to the Riot into Mining Tourist train station, nestled between the towns of Miners de Riot into Anerva, for an extraordinary Martian adventure. Today, we'll delve into the expansive Riot into Mines, spanning a vast area. Visitors have several options to explore, and we opted for a ticket that includes access to the mining train, Mars on Earth, the Mining Museum, and House 21. We grabbed a tortilla from the cafeteria at the train station, which served as a satisfying breakfast. Soon after, we boarded the pneumatic train that transported us straight to Mars. Of course, we weren't actually traveling to another planet, but to a designated site within the Rio Tinto mine, aptly named Mars on Earth. It's advisable to book tickets in advance as availability is not guaranteed at the venue. You can find information about ticket prices on their official website, the link of which can be found in the description below the video. Mars on Earth offers an exciting experience at the Rio Tinto Mining Park, providing visitors with a fascinating insight into the similarities between this corner of Huelva and the Red Planet. We traveled by pneumatic train through the fascinating landscapes that have attracted the attention of many scientists. While much of the mine area is accessible on foot, wandering along the banks of the Red River, the route of the pneumatic train and its destinations offer a unique perspective that can only be experienced aboard this train. The approximate duration of this family-friendly program is 1 hour and 30 minutes. During the journey, we could also catch a glimpse of the Rio Tinto, the Red River, but the mining train offers a better opportunity to observe it, which will be our next destination. However, the ruins of the metallurgical complex of the Rio Tinto mines are magnificently visible, standing as silent witnesses to the area's industrial past. These remnants dot the landscape, offering a glimpse into the region's rich history and heritage. We've made two stops on the tour, and we're just about to arrive at the first one, Red Earth, which will allow us to step onto Mars without leaving Earth. Here, you can experience the sensation of being in a real Mars station, complete with a scale reproduction of various elements related to space exploration, such as the rover. The Rio Tinto area boasts an acidic and harsh environment similar to that of our neighboring planet, Mars. This environment fascinates scientists because its mineralogical and geological composition closely resembles what has been found on the Red Planet. Therefore, several researchers are studying the life that has developed in this environment in the presence of high acidity and low oxygen levels, while attempting to answer the question, if life is possible in Rio Tinto, could it also exist on Mars? Furthermore, this station serves as a testing ground for NASA and ESA, where vehicles, modules, and equipment intended for use on Mars undergo rigorous testing. This area was originally a waste deposit for the copper mining concentrator, which contains a significant historical and geological heritage. Over time, wind and rain transformed the waste deposit, resulting in the landscape of bright red soil that characterizes the region today. 
This area, with its distinctive red hues, stands as a testament to the mining activity that once flourished here. Although Tierra Roja was initially a waste deposit, today it is a unique element of the Rio Tinto mining landscape, attracting visitors with its striking colors and interesting history. The Curiosity rover arrived on Mars on August 8, 2012, after traveling 567 million kilometers from Earth. The vehicle successfully landed on the surface of the Red Planet following a risky landing maneuver. Its mission is to search for signs of life on Mars. Here, you can see a replica of the rover, with the original located on Mars, carrying equipment that was tested here. Afterward, we boarded the pneumatic train once again and proceeded to our next destination, the extraterrestrial landscape known as the Great Black Wall. This remarkable site, with its spectacular features, is a popular filming location for movies, commercials, and television series. El último así grande que ha habido ha sido la grabación de una serie de como caparazones de tortuga justamente en, en las escorias, ¿no? El color negro de la escoria es 60 años de fundición. This immense black wall is the result of material accumulated from the metallurgical operations of copper production between 1907 and 1970. It primarily consists of iron and silicic acid, commonly known as slag. Presently, it holds 2.7 million tons spread across a 14-hectare site, with an average height of 20 meters. Over the 63 years of operation, this landfill transformed into a unique landscape, a metallic mountain. The incandescent material deposited here solidified akin to volcanic lava, shaping the terrain into its current form. The dominant black color is punctuated by yellow spots from sulfur, red spots from iron, and green spots from copper, adding to the visual diversity of the area. In this area, only one plant species thrives, Erica and Valensis. This species is noteworthy for its ability to predominantly grow in soils contaminated with metals, often found in mining areas.
es lo único que tiene en flor, es la flor rosa que tiene. Vamos a ver otra aquí también flor. Mira, esa, esa planta es prosperar. ¿Por qué eh, hace una floración tan larga? Si es oportunidad para que los polinizadores vengan y la polinizan. Es una especie de desarrollo genético que le da la, al aprovechamiento de la humedad del suelo. Porque es Our train turns around, we go back to the entrance of the black wall and stop there to observe this strange wall more closely. Now we are heading back to our starting point, where we can once again observe the mining area.
Arriving back at the station, we boarded the mining train, embarking on another journey, this time along the Red River. Looking out the window, we spotted mountain goats gracefully navigating the rugged terrain of the hillside adjacent to the tracks. Their sure-footedness and agility were impressive as they effortlessly traversed the rocky slopes, seemingly unfazed by the steep incline. Their presence added to the sense of wilderness and natural beauty that surrounded us, offering a glimpse into the diverse ecosystem of the area. Before the construction of the railway between Rio Tinto and the port of Huelva, transporting goods was a daunting task. Wagons pulled by donkeys and mules were utilized for the initial stretch up to Valverde del Camino. From there, the goods were transferred to rail and transported to San Juan del Puerto. Finally, barges were employed along the Rio Tinto for the last leg of the journey, reaching the ships anchored at the port of Huelva. However, in the latter half of the 19th century, the arrival of the British company, Rio Tinto Company Limited, brought about a revolutionary change with the construction of the railway line. This development sparked economic and social growth in the region. The railway tracks ran parallel to the Rio Tinto River, crossing eight iron bridges and five tunnels. In Huelva, a pier over five kilometers long was constructed, facilitating the direct loading of goods from the railway onto ships. The railway system offered three primary services, internal lines connecting different mining departments, a general line linking Rio Tinto and Huelva, and side lines connecting nearby villages, providing transportation for travelers and miners alike. However, with the establishment of a chemical plant in Huelva in 1964, the railway began to lose its significance. With no longer a need to transport or to England, it became more economical to use lorries. The last train carrying minerals ran in 1985. Today, 12 kilometers of this historic railway line have been restored, operating as tourist trains with the aim of allowing visitors to explore this unique landscape and learn about the mining history that once thrived here.
We arrived at the terminus and disembarked from the train, allowing us to observe the Rio Tinto River up close. Known for its reddish waters, the river stretches over 100 kilometers, originating in the Andalusian Sierra Morena Mountains before flowing into the Gulf of Cadiz in Huelva. The river contains an impressive 7 grams of minerals per liter. What makes the Rio Tinto truly remarkable is its unique ecosystem, where iron oxide and sulfuric acid give the water its distinctive reddish hue. These compounds are produced by underground microorganisms inhabiting the rock pores. These single-celled organisms thrive in complete darkness, feeding on iron and sulfur and producing oxygen as a byproduct. Despite the harsh conditions, such as the oligotrophic environment with minimal food sources, life flourishes in the depths. However, it remains uncertain how much of the water's acidity stems from natural processes versus mining activities. Scientists from the Madrid Astrobiology Center have been studying this area for over 30 years, intrigued by its highly acidic nature with a pH of around 2.3 and the oxygen-depleted conditions at lower depths. Due to recent heavy rainfall in the region, the water in the river is currently less red compared to drier and warmer periods. The warmer water intensifies the river's red hue. While the Rio Tinto's waters lack fish due to their extreme conditions, microorganisms manage to survive, showcasing the resilience of life in such environments. The train reversed its direction and we reboarded, choosing seats on the side that offered a view of the river for the return trip to the starting point.
After our return to the mining train station, we proceeded towards Minas de Rio Tinto, a village with ancient roots yet modern infrastructure. Here, iron, silver, and copper mines have been actively operating for approximately five millennia. While the Roman era marked the zenith of mining activity, there was a period of dormancy following the decline of the Roman Empire until the 17th century. However, in the 19th century, the village experienced a resurgence with the arrival of the English. For years, the village has relied on the mines from which it derived its name. Minas de Rio Tinto reached its peak of prosperity and importance in the late 19th and early 20th centuries when the mines were in full production, and the population numbered 200,000. The city itself is situated on rolling hills, now covered with pine and eucalyptus trees planted by the British. One of the most significant features of the Rio Tinto mining park is the Corta Atelier open pit mine. To visit this site, we had to walk approximately 25 minutes from the mining museum where we parked. Although we didn't have tickets for entry, we were fortunate to discover a free observation deck nearby, offering a good vantage point to admire the mine. Returning to the village, we headed to Casa 21 de Bella Vista. The British managers of the Rio Tinto Company Limited, which settled in the town, created their own neighborhood, the Bella Vista district, keeping to their own traditions and way of life, distancing themselves from the hometown. Bella Vista had a distinctive lifestyle that followed English aesthetics, architecture, and customs. They played sports, tennis, polo, cricket, that were unknown in Spain until then. In the heart of the British Quarter is House 21, built in 1885 for a high-ranking engineer, which still retains all the details, furniture, and fittings of the Victorian style. Our combined ticket was also valid here, so we didn't have to pay extra for this visit. On the three floors of the house, visitors can explore the furniture, photographs, and texts detailing certain celebrations and sports, providing insight into the social life of British engineers and their families. Before heading to the mining museum, we decided to take a brief stroll through the village, immersing ourselves in its atmosphere.
The mining museum occupies a building that once served as a hospital and holds the distinction of being Spain's first museum dedicated to mining and metallurgy history. Offering insight into the mining culture and lifestyle of Rio Tinto during its peak extraction period, the museum spans an expansive 1,800 square meters of exhibition space. Divided into eight sections, visitors can explore a range of exhibits, including a reproduction of a Roman mine and an ethnographic display. The permanent exhibition delves into the environmental and geological characteristics of the region before delving into its mining history. Among its highlights are numerous artifacts spanning the area's lengthy mining legacy, along with iconic industrial relics such as the Maharaja carriage, the world's most opulent narrow-gauge railway car. Crafted specifically for a journey that never occurred, transporting Queen Victoria to India, the carriage remains a testament to the area's historical significance. Rio Tinto's mines were completely shut down in 2001, but there have been rumors that they may be reopened in the future, as they still hold a large amount of untapped minerals. Thank you for joining us on this journey. Although we must say goodbye for now, keep an eye out for our next part, where we'll explore two prominent Andalusian cities. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, so you never miss out on our adventures. Wishing you a wonderful day ahead!